Uh, you are now. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's the plan. This is the plan. Soon. Oh, I'm not hearing you talk about the mic. Okay. Hello. Welcome to class two. It's good to see everybody. Um, I was just telling Laura, she says, you look so serious, and I said, well, it's because I'm trying to center, and because I, I listen to things like pink to get me psyched up for my classes at, at work, and so I'm like, just like fire, and so that happened to still be in my car, and so I was like, on the way here, you guys are outside, you may have heard the beat, and so I'm like, oh, and it's like, that's not quite the right music to play before I come in and do a treatment, I suppose. But I guess my question is, is that I was just asking Laura, do we have to be serious? No. Do we, does that require that? Do we always need to start with a moment of silence? Do we always need to start with the treatment? Or does the treatment always have to be sombering and graceful? You know, um, <laughs> like let it all go and come to center and here we are. Like where is the enjoyment in life there? Um, I don't know. I'm just being a little questioning tonight. I thought I would pose the question to you because hiking and laughing and talking is as much to me being in the moment as, as trying to stand here and, and reduce pink to a low background hum, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like that. So um, I just wanted to say that out loud. And now let's start. Can I use the mic? I have it on? Uh, please start it with lunch. Say what? Make sure it's turned on. I did. Okay. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> you know what? It's off. I mean, it's on, but it, there's no green light. Is there a battery in it? I see. I don't even have a green it's light to go. <laughs> Hello? Yep, there you go. Hello. So that was it? So okay. So off is on? <laughs> <laughs> Help me sound. <laughs> so is it on? Yes. And is it on now? It doesn't sound. No. Is it on now? <laughs> is my buddy off is on? Seriously. No, off is on. Prove me now here with it. Your guy. Prove me now here with it says off. Okay, it should be I, I will. I, they're not going to be able to stop me tonight. <laughs> so does it sound like it's on? No. no. Does it sound like it's on? Yes. Yeah. 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 It says off. Uh, I like that. It kind of goes with my mood today, doesn't it? Just kind of like, do we have to do things this way? Can we do them in alternative fashions? Because Emma's very strict and she believes in discipline. Discipline, discipline, repetition, repetition. And so um, Emma suggests that we start every session with a moment of silence. And so, but while you're thinking, while you're contemplating and settling yourselves into the class today, let's be thinking of, um, we're going to do an individual check-in. Remember, no crosstalk. And um, it'll be on volunteer only, so it's not like we're going to go around the table. But I hope everyone chooses to share. And I want you to think about, one, um, how you are, obviously, like, check in, let us know how you're doing. And the second thing I would like to know is, um, what do you want to say in your check-in? And I want you to reflect on the readings and mention anything that you want to explore more deeply, and I'll put it on the board. Did something strike you? So let's, let's start there tonight, and we'll put that on the board, and we'll see if we can't hit all of those points that people were like, I don't quite understand, I don't, or I disagree, you know, let's, let's discuss all of those things that everyone's thinking. So that's where I'd like you to go, reflect on how you would like, what you would like to say, what you've received from the readings this week, and if you didn't have a book, that's fine, still check in. And maybe tell us, um, like last week, we talked about why we, why we were here or what we hope to gain, right? And so um, you can do that 
just reflect on that and let's center, and then we'll start with the spiritual one too. In this space, I know that there is one breath, one life, one heart source that is shared among everything, among everyone, and I know that I am one with that source. I know I am the breath of life. I know that my heartbeat is the joy of the divine, and I am present here now. And I know that this is true for everyone here. I know that it's true for the people who are out there listening to my voice. I know it's true for the people who will interact with everyone here after tonight's session is over. And I feel so grateful for this. I know that there is abundance and joy and happiness in everything that happens, that there is only good in the world, and that that good manifests itself in many ways, many ways that we sometimes don't recognize, sometimes that we don't see, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. And I know this in the bottom of my heart. I know it in the soles of my feet as I walk on this sacred earth, that I am one with the divine, and I am grateful. I'm grateful and I'm blessed. And I know that everything that is shared here tonight comes from the heart. I know that we are all here present, supportive of each other, knowing only, knowing only the good that we see in each other's eyes. And as I close this treatment, I release it into law, knowing that it is acted upon, knowing that it is true. And together we say, yes. so it is. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, I've already kind of checked in. I'm a little like uh, 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 bouncy today. And, um, but part of that I think is there's just I love reading Emma Curtis Hopkins. Like prepping for this class, I have, I have made it a priority over everything else I do, and because I enjoy it so much more. And so, um, which, you know, I taught five classes today earlier, so that's kind of sad for them that they they're learning about Emma Curtis Hopkins. As well. <laughs> I was like, yes, but. In communication, it all comes from the self, and it's all good. <laughs> so repent, rejoice, forgive. Anyway, so no, I don't say that to them. But um, <laughs> in my head, I do. <laughs> anyway, so um, so check in. Who would like to start? I'll start. Um, do you want me? Yeah, let's just say our first names again for people who aren't, uh, you know, familiar with the in crowd, so to speak. Okay, Sue. So, um, so this is, I don't know if this was actually in um, the first two chapters, but it keeps coming up. If it wasn't there, it will come up again. And it's the whole business about um, matter not being real. About what? Matter not being real. Okay. And it's referred to by many of, of you know, science of learning people. Right. So, um, I guess, you know, my issue with that is how do you define real? You know, what is real? Right. Yeah, that's, yeah. And how are you? How am I? Mm -hmm. Feeling. Happy, sad, glad, man. Oh. How are you doing? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Okay. Pretty good. Yeah. Great. Thank you for starting us off, Sue. I'm Laura. I'm doing very well today. I've had a good day um, and had a parenting win right before I came over with homework, so I was kind of excited about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
So what really struck me in the reading, and that, especially the wording and the phrasing of it, it just really, it wasn't like a new idea, but it was just like, oh, that just really makes sense. And it was just about how you can tell someone's idea of good and what they're striving for good by how they are and what they say and by their face, I think yeah. is what it said. And, um, and I was just thinking about, like I'd read a story about um, how a certain political figure had grown up with Norman Vincent Peale and some other positive thought folks, and I'm like, well, how in the world did they end up how they are? <laughs> And I thought, like, you can use material and religion for all sorts of different paths. Mm -hmm. And even if you read the same thing I read, you don't have the same outcome necessarily. And you can still be successful at it with your own idea of success and outcomes. <coughs> and it doesn't matter what my idea of success and outcomes is. The principles are the same and they work. Right. And you can take from them what you want and okay. kind of leave some of the other ones aside so that was just so that whole idea got me thinking about that and that if that's true with any religion then that you can tell what they're striving for as their good or their god by how they are not necessarily what they say they are okay thank you yeah that makes total sense um i'm going to remind you we're i've decided not to try the microphone thing I think we did it. I don't think it went over very well. So let's just remember to speak up because one, I have, I like it's a large room and sometimes it's difficult to hear people. So um, speak up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Could you paraphrase what she said? Because I didn't get any of it. Sorry. Okay. I'll talk louder next do you want to do say it in a I'll nutshell it. again? I'll say it quicker. Um, that the phrase that stuck out to me was the you can know a person and what they're striving for as their good or their God by their face and who they are. Right. Kind of like their actions speak louder than their words. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. My name's Robert, and I uh, had a question on 17 we might get to at some point. Uh, last section of the last paragraph, in which they seem to be putting forth the idea that poverty Material things is the path to God. Okay. All right. So, where are the. Page 17. I got it. Next to that paragraph. The Talk Judas Genius? Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to talk about that too. That, okay. That was one of the things that's been on my mind for okay the, so what they're referring to for people who don't have a book at this point is the Judas genius is opened in us when we perceive divine intelligence that pure poverty of apparent things is God possessing all his spirit I am to own and possess no thing Laotza the ancient master who wrote the Tao Te Ching taught that we must produce but not possess so through this first gate, my intellect, I let all know, and all that I have been taught, go free. I know nothing. The wisdom of the schools is foolishness with God. So that's the paragraph they're speaking of. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, which kind of goes to matter does not equal real, right? And so we're going to be talking about, um, how would she phrase it? Poverty, let's just talk, let's talk about, um, Poverty versus possession. possession. Okay? All right. We'll get there. I know we will. P-O-S-S-E-S-I-O-N? Two S's. Two S's. Oh, two S's and S-S-I-O-N? I think so. Yeah. This is my students do this to me all the time. You come up here and write this fast. <laughs> okay. So who else? I'm Terry, and um, I, I grew up with you. Uh, I was brought up as a very strict Catholic, and uh, the, uh, the thing that was they they talked about people with hair shirts and you know that type of thing, and, and not not owning um, to, to be poor was was the, the proper way to get to heaven. <coughs> And I'm so glad I don't have to believe it. <laughs> um, but I, I was not here last week, 
and I, I do not have a book, and I've never read anything uh, about Curtis Hopkins, uh, Emma, Emma Curtis Hopkins, is mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I'm not familiar with what everyone is talking about, but uh, I've heard that you're a good teacher, so I wanted to oh, be here. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Vivian, and I'm feeling pretty fantastic this evening. I practice, uh, I, I started in right away on the practice in the first lesson um, and really focusing on my good as my God. And uh, on Wednesday, before I came to class, um, I put in an application for a transfer to another theater. I'm a general manager at a movie theater. And on Thursday, I got the call to schedule an interview. And on Friday, I had the interview, and it went phenomenal. Uh, I'll backtrack a minute. I, I went on to the CSL's website for the city that I want to transfer to and put in a prayer request on Thursday night that my interview would go really great, and then I would get a job offer. I had a really great interview on Friday. I got the call on Saturday that I got the job. And we started um, salary negotiations on Monday. Um, and I'm moving to Ventura, California. Ooh. A lot more um, money, and uh, my company is completely paying 100% for me to move across the country. I get a cost of living bonus in addition to my salary increase. And the best part of all is I'm only four hours north of my son and soon to be born grandson. So wow. that was the most important thing. So, so my good is my God. <laughs> all right. Did, did you go yes, me next? That was great. Oh, that was great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm Mary Lou, and I'm doing you this speak up. Can't hear you and well. I talk real quiet. <laughs> um, I'm doing pretty pretty well also. Um, one thing I, in the reading, I, I really enjoyed all of it also. Um, and uh, But one thing sticking in my mind is a, a question, you know, is like, um, you know, God is my good and all is good, all is God. It's when it gets to the part of that there's no evil, you know, I, I can I can spiritually get to that point where I can see someone who's done something apparently evil and, and see that they're also God and they're also, you know, the experience. But it's, it's hard, and I've sat back think back and I just was wondering what some other people you know had some discussion on. So that. you're interested in the duality of that kind of what we perceive to be good and evil, that kind of thing? You want to talk about it in that way? Um, or how do you stay out of that mindset? Yeah, that where something just doesn't don't automatically go to how evil. Yeah. Okay, so um, how would you like me to phrase that for a quick sentence? Uh, maybe so evil, what, versus good, or evil okay. is Okay, so evil, you do want to talk about kind evil of that. Evil is good. That duality, okay. Good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and put duality there, because duality of evil versus good, and see where that, where that takes us in a in the conversation, because that's a good question. How do we how do we stay out of those mindsets that have us in this this kind of parallel universe almost? Good point. Mm -hmm. I'm Rick. <clears throat> I'm doing really well. Uh, one, one thing that really struck me in here uh, was on uh, page 24, the footnote 20. Uh, what uh, the argument that Emma had with uh, Mrs. Eddy's scientific statement of being. I remember a number of years ago, quite a number of years ago, I had a uh, disagreement with a Christian science practitioner 
And I, I said almost the identical thing, but uh, because they're, uh, it starts out to say there, there is no substance, life, truth, or uh, whatever, it, it matter. All is infinite mind, and that's infinite manifestations for God's all. And, all. and uh, <clears throat> so I, my thought was that right now our highest level of perception is to uh, is, is form. You know, we can't get away from that. And uh, so if we tell ourselves that God is not in matter, uh, then uh, we're teaching ourselves that there's a place where the infinite is not. Right. Right. And it's just uh, reason. You know, it's like, and I think he and I used an arm. I had a uh, injury on my arm at the time, and uh, he said, well, he said, do you believe that there's an arm that needs to be healed? And I said, no, I, I said, there's a principle behind the arm. It's, to me, it's utility and dexterity and usefulness. Right. And that principle is in, in the absolute, and that is what I perceive as my arm. And the clearer I can get on that, you know, but to say that God's not in my arm, he is the principle of my arm, you know. So, and I was really intrigued that she felt the same way. Right. You know? Okay. So. Good, because we'll be talking more about that as well, the difference, some, a little bit about the difference between Christian science and science of mind, or Emma Curtis Hopkins, rather. Yeah. Which lends itself to Ernest Holmes, who we'll also be talking about again. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I had a, I've been working on this almost as soon as I got the book, which was on Thursday, and you know that God is my good. Oh, my good is my God. Excuse me, a little dyslexic for real. Um, but I woke up. I have a fear of being late, and I like to be at my center at 10 o'clock because I teach the children's program. And on Sunday, I woke up at 9:56. <laughs> and I'm like, oh great, so I first called the minister to let her know where I am, and we arranged things, and I was in the shower, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to be so late, what's the point? And then I said, this is my good, and this is my God. Well, I showered, started the coffee, walked the dog, put dinner in the crock pot, and got to the church by 1045, which is a 20-minute drive from my house, 1045, finished my coffee and had a wonderful children's lesson. I mean, it was just like, it all worked out when I just realized that this is my good, this is my God, everything's going to be fine. All right. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. I'm Kristen. Um, I was not here last week, but I did read the first chapter. I did not know about the second chapter reading. <laughs> Uh, because the teacher said that only the first chapter was due when I asked her <laughs> yesterday. And a little bit of doubt. <laughs> um, I'm doing good. I'm a little tired tonight, but I'm happy to be here. Um, so I took the, I really like the, my good is my God. And I like the part, I don't know where it is in here, but where um, she talked about how you can just, somebody who's appearing like they're putting something else before God, like an idol of some sort or an addiction, where you can just speak the truth to them, and it completely turns it around. And I really like that idea that it's like not as big of, an, of a deal as we make it. Like It's as easy as just that one little thing can shift everything because it's not really real, you know? And then I also, I kind of took it the other way as like, my good is my God, and my God is my good, so what am I focusing on, and what am I putting ahead of other things, and what do I want to be my God, and put first as my good, and things like that, so that's kind of how I looked at it this week. Good. Thank you.
So one thing that I consider my good is my vehicle because it gets me everywhere I want to go. But then I couldn't go to that my vehicle was my God. I just couldn't get that. So I had to go to it's my highest good that is my God. So I can I know I know that God is in the vehicle. I don't have any problems with knowing that since God is in everything, even this table. You know, I don't have any problems with that. It was just like going to the statement that my vehicle is my God. I just couldn't quite go there. Okay. So I had to change it to my highest good is my God. Okay. I think that, that kind of goes to both of those, these two things, or all three of them really, how that goes. So we'll be talking about that. Because you hit on it, and so um, we'll talk more about that. My name's Roxanne. I, I was really playing a lot again with the semantics of good and God, and whichever one you put first. Mm -hmm. And it hooked back to what I said last week, that the attraction to me in both of the Emma books that I have is the focus on inner vision, looking upward, focusing on the divine God, um, and all else shall be added unto you. And I, I love the simplicity of that. So I was framing this as God is all there is, good is all there is, God is good. So that's, that's already there, God encompasses anything that I consider my good or don't yet even realize is my good. So that if I just stay with her formula of keeping my eyes on you, or it, or us, then all else is added unto me. And I can get specific about what that good is. It's not that I can't have a vision for what I want, but I, I just like the way the pieces fit together. Okay. And um, it, to me, in a way, it streamlined it down, rather than the interpretation that I want a car, so the car must, or I love my car, as an example, or my house, or right, a house is kind of relevant right now, um, that, that I, if, that, if that's my God, because that's what I'm going for, it's like, it becomes an idol, sort of. It's like a false okay. God. It's really something that comes from God. So. Right, which is what these women have been saying over right. there. Good Same. point. And yeah. today, or, or I'll say of how I'm feeling, it's very good. And today we're renting a house that we like very much, and we've known someday they were going to sell the property, and we don't want to buy the property and everything. So the landlady shows up today unexpected, and when I get home, she's measuring the rooms because she's planning to move back in. And I'm not real confident that's going to happen for a lot of reasons, but I'm, what I feel really good about is I'm just fine with it. And then some of you heard me share what happened with my heart test, and having had an experience like that, it's like we're going to be here and be happy, we're going to be somewhere else and be happy. Fine. All right. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And you touched on a little bit on that kind of inductive deductive process that we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to yes. we're going to clear that mystery up. <laughs> My name is David, and um, I'm doing really well today. I had a 90 minute massage, which is my birthday present to myself, and I rarely do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, usually I just buy a toy, but anyway, this is really good, so I'm feeling pretty relaxed and I'm surprised I can think at all. Um, and um, my thinking is very similar to what Roxanne described, and um, I guess I would say it as the, the realm of relativity, good versus evil, black and white, up and down, is, is a subset or lives within the on the presence that is God, and um, and in that sense, God's in everything. And in the realm of relativity, it looks all, all kinds of ways. But I decide what, what I mean good and what I mean evil. But that's a lot of relative in the absolute. And so, in the absolute, there's only one thing happening. And my interest is living and having the experience of absoluteness that. Right. So, it's kind of where it all goes for me. And, and I really, really, really enjoy where uh, reading the book takes me, just in terms of feeling. It just really gets me really spacious, and I like being spaced. So. Yeah, I like that, too. <laughs> Thank you, David.
My name is Dee, and uh, I think, well, I'm having a wonderful time with this reading and with Emma. I think she's terrific. <laughs> the, um, the one sentence that really struck me is on page 27, which says, sensation is sight, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, which are essentially mental faculties, non-material in nature. They are faculties of spirit. It goes on, spirit, God is your sight, is your hearing, is your skill in every faculty, uh, nor can any of the five senses bring you anything but good. And it, I don't know how I got there, but it's probably through all the studying I've been doing, I suddenly caught a glimpse, a tiny glimpse, that even my, all my senses, including my thoughts, which tell me you're here, this person is here, and this is solid, this is real, if spirit is everywhere present, but I can't see it, um, then I need to open my mind, as she says in the first chapter, to throw everything out the window and somehow start with a blank slate to understand this poverty of, not possessions, but I got the poverty of appearances. Right, right, okay. So that's, it's all on the board already. Right, that's a good point. That's good, good phrasing, poverty of appearances. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting phrase. That's it for the check-ins. No one else would like to check in? Okay. And maybe next time we will go around the circle. <laughs> <laughs> Make it so voluntary. How's that? <laughs> and then what are you going to do? You're going to have to speak up in order to say pass. <laughs> As you go. <laughs> All right. So let's go over the, the let's start at the beginning. First of all, make sure you sign in. Last week we had 30 people here, and I, Nancy was like, no you don't, that's not who signed in. And I was like, there were 30 people in here. And so, there's 27 tonight. Please sign in, even if you don't want to get the certificate. If you want the certificate at the end of the class, you have to sign in, right? So, please do, because um, Nancy likes to track things that way. So, um, I know you were here, but please, please sign in. Also, um, remember, help clean up everybody. Help put the chairs back, make sure the kitchen is clean, coffee pots put away. And if everyone assisted with that, then one or two people won't get stuck in the kitchen. And there are some people I wish wouldn't help because they do so much here already. And I'm looking at Rick. and. Um, just go home, right? <laughs> you are good. So, um, but other people, if we could just stay and make sure everyone gets out around the same time, that would be great. And then, um, so, <clears throat> inductive, deductive. Let's just take it right from Ernest. And this is the original science of mind. And on page 71, I'm going to be looking at 71 and 89, primarily. And he says... There are but two processes of reasoning known to the human mind. One is inductive and the other is deductive. Now remember, this is the human mind he's talking about. Inductive reasoning is an inquiry into the truth. It is a process of analysis. Deductive reasoning is that process of reasoning which allows an already established premise. It is from the whole to the part. Since inductive reasoning is an analysis, which is always an inquiry into truth, it follows that God can only reason deductively. That which is infinite does not have to inquire into the truth. Consequently, there is no inductive process of reasoning, either in the spirit or the soul of the universe. Right. So as humans, we have this unique capacity 
to do inductive and deductive reasoning. But my impression of what happens in our books is that we get caught up in that duality between inductive and deductive, this kind of evil versus good thing, because we analyze it instead of just knowing the truth. If we are the I am, and we are the I am, every one of us should be able to say that every morning. You should be saying it every morning according to Emma Hopkins. I am my good, I am my good, I am my good, my God is my good, my good is my God. I am that which I speak, I am my voice, right? She has a whole list of things in there that she wants you to say every morning. That is the God speaking through. So that is, that is deductive reasoning. Okay? Holmes goes on to say, and say it again in another way, which he loves to do on page 89. There are two ways to reason. There are two processes of reasoning known to the human mind, inductive and deductive. And from these two ways of reasoning, all our knowledge of life has come. Inductive reasoning is the systematic process of reasoning from a part to the whole. Deductive is the process of accepting certain conclusions as truths and drawing our conclusions from them. It is reasoning from the whole to the part. For instance, in inductive reasoning, we would say that everything happens just as there were, just as if there were what we call electricity, and that electricity is everywhere present. Deductive reasoning says that since electricity is everywhere present, it is always where we are and can always be generated from any center. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. There's, it's a slight difference, but one is claiming it as spirit, and the other is looking at it and analyzing it, going, oh, since it's here, it's everywhere. And the other is saying, it's already here. There's an assumption of acceptance. And so that assumption of acceptance goes exactly to what you're talking about when we fall into these, these, this, what Holmes would call race consciousness of believing that there's duality, that there's good and evil, that there's bad and good, that there's black and white, what David was referencing. And so um, it's working past that. And Emma Curtis Hopkins works us past that through this chapter on what she calls repent, repentance. Right? And it's what I was talking about a little bit last week. We have to be self-reflective in order to look at our belief systems like you're doing, or being open to say, I don't understand this. What does this mean for me? So that we can change who we are. Because repenting is, I read it and then I wrote it down. I think it's in this one. <laughs> what she means by repenting is... No, I know where she means it. I got it. So, um, so that's where we are, and I'm going to do this in a minute. But does that help with inductive, deductive? Michael, you were the one who was questioning that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to sing no, you no, out, no, so, no, 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 um, no. So you, you brought it up. I, yeah, but the, the, that question's I'm now slightly more confused. Because, so, the whole thing started with um, my good is my God, mm -hmm. and then, you know, and then bringing up that if I can, if I just accept that everything is God, then I can accept that everything that happens is, is God, because God is all. Right. Wouldn't, so, wouldn't accepting God as all and then therefore everything falls under under the the umbrella of God be deductive reasoning and wouldn't then my good is my God be inductive reasoning? Because you're analyzing it? Yes. And wouldn't that then kind of go contrary to the what Ernest was saying that spirit is is only true, it, well, can only exist in the deductive, only knows the deductive form of, of reasoning and does not know inductive because the truth is just the truth. Okay. First I'm going to say contrary takes us back to opposites and back to that analyzing. 
in that what Emma Curtis Hopkins and Holmes is saying is like, accept it as fact, right? That we have the ability to rationalize and analyze it can be, it can be a duality, it can be a blessing and it can be a real pain because then we get ourselves, I can analyze myself right into confusion and then I can go, I'm just confused, I don't understand. And if I stop the analyzing and just go, God is good, my good is my God, according to Emma, I am that which I am. I am, right? Remember we were doing that in the mystics, and it changed everything for me. My life just took a flip every time we did that stuff. It was just, we'll do it in here too for people who don't know what we're talking about. But um, it's that, it's that, just blanket acceptance. And I would say you're right in that sense that when we go to my good is my God, is that not a little bit of the deductive reasoning or is it a phrase that's trying to bring us to the whole that just, just say recognize the whole, don't, don't, don't try to fractionalize it or, you know, know that you already are. So everything you come in contact with is as well. <laughs> there it is. It's all over. Yeah. I don't know. That's my that's my discussion for you. But I would like other people to join in that. I got to turn this off. So. Mine is going to go off in the wind because all is God, and there was energy right there like coming straight for my phone. Yes. So is that where you would want the idea of faith to, I mean, faith is basically taking, just accepting something and not trying to analyze it or, so that's where we want to right. bring our faith in, whether it's deductive or inductive, and just make that blanket statement. Right. But as unique human beings, we get this great opportunity to be self-reflective and look at who we are, right? And, and that we can't ignore that because that framework is with us always. We can only look at it and go, okay, there's a lesson there. What is that lesson? And move forward because right now is really all we have. And to what Emma says through repentance is to say, this happened. This is who I am. Be self-reflective. Acknowledge it. And then stop it. Knock it off. Change it. Make it better. Do whatever you need to do, but know that you are God right now in this moment because we can't predict what's going to happen and we don't have a past right but that doesn't mean ignore what happened in the past because we have lessons that we've learned there's a reason that we're here on earth in this form to be god in spirit or to be god in form i don't know that answer to those two questions they just kind of popped into my head but it goes to that concept of quantum physics, right? Connected. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's why I, I love doing these classes, because I like asking you. That if it makes sense, if it doesn't make sense, then we need to keep talking about it. We don't have to come to a universal agreement. That's up to you. All right? I'm in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> With yourself? With myself. And you know what, what the, what's really fun with that is that tomorrow morning in meditation, I might have another moment of enlightenment and go, wow, next week I have to remember to tell them everything I just said was bunk. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you do. You have to be able to be self-reflective and step forward to become more God, more that I am. That's how I, how I see it. So there are no mistakes. There's only stepping forward into new. Everything that happened for us in our life is just that, it's stepping forward into new. So we need to reflect on it, but we can't stay in those stories because those stories don't go anywhere. They go to an inductive form of reasoning that creates a reality that's often not true. Often not true. I've had a couple examples of that. Um, in interactions with people recently. As where assumptions led to something else and it was like, that's, that's not quite it. So, anyway, we've all had those encounters. 
And one of mine was with um, with one of the water houses, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> but Emma, in 1988, she wrote, uh, is everyone good right now? Can we move forward? Or do you want to talk more about inductive and deductive? Yeah, we're no, we're done yeah, with It that. doesn't seem very much like mysticism. We're going to get back to the mysticism. Part. I think it is very is mystical, it? personally. Yeah, yeah, I do. Like when you realize that you problem. are that you are the God that you are, right? I am the God that I am. I think that's very mystical, and that's very well, deductive. I agree with that. I guess I just got lost in the... In, in the analyzing? Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. So, um, and I know, that's... that's um, anyway, let's see. Okay. So, um, <laughs> in 1988, Emma, about this first chapter... Eighteen eighty. Eighteen eighty. She's with us. She said so. In eighteen eighty-eight, in scientific Christian mental practice, she wrote, "One God, one mind, one word equals good. Good is God." In the class lessons in nineteen eighty-eight, she changed it. Eighteen eighty-eight. In eighteen eighty-eight. <laughs> For me in 1980. <laughs> That's something to reflect on. So um, she says, Life is good, good is God, God is life, first cause is one mind. And so now she's talking a little bit more about where Honors Holmes is coming from around first cause. And then she says, In 1892, in high mysticism, she says, Look up, repent, keep high watch, behold who the half created. Behold who hath created. Hath created. Look up, repent, keep high watch. And what she's saying is, keep an eye on yourself for this kind of inductive reasoning. Don't step back. Keep high watch. When we hold high watch in the center, we are holding, we try to hold the good, right? We try to hold the love. We don't try, we do. When we're meditating, it's just it's this amazing, peaceful. Serena, Selena, have you done high watch? Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It's amazing. And when we do it, there's so much love in the sanctuary. <coughs> you would not believe it because I sometimes I I can when I'm not holding high watch, I see people and I and I feel like they're alone. Right? It feels to me, and so I want to reach out to them and I want to talk to them or something to bring them in. But when I'm holding high watch, that feeling leaves me. And it's inclusive, it's, it's, it is everything. Everyone's energy creates that one being, that one feeling. I'm, there's no words for it. We can try all day long to describe it. But it is, it is that. It is the I am. And when you're, we're done, those are the people to catch for a minute miracle, if, if they stand, because they're so in place. It's, it's awesome. It really is. Don't you agree? I agree. Yeah, we don't have, there's, a, is there another, there's not another practitioner here tonight, right? So, those are the, comparing those three books, or those three things, and that's what she says. So you can see that she changes slightly. She's using the same words, but her perception is changing just a little bit. But let's learn about Emma Curtis Hopkins, since a lot of us don't, didn't know her. Okay. Some of you know a lot about Emma, a whole lot more than I do. But So she came out of the, she was born in this time of what's called the transcendentalist. Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, Quimby, and um, so she ba they based their philosophy on the ancient idea of law of correspondence, or that the micros microism reflects the macro, right? Micro reflects the macro. And so she was born there in 1849, but um, she was the oldest of nine children and raised on a farm, and she was really, really smart. In, she was 25, she married Hopkins, which explains her name, Emma Curtis Hopkins. And um, they had a son who died at 30. And the, Emma and George lived separate lives, beginning in the 1880s. And eventually, he filed for divorce on the grounds of abandonment. So it doesn't say what she was doing during that time. But it does say this, that in the early 80s, she had an ailment related to breathing. 
and went to a Christian science practitioner. And out of that experience, she contacted Mary Baker Eddy and began studying with Ms. Eddy in Boston. And then um, she became the editor of the Christian Science Journal. But Mrs. Eddy, this is how they explain their separation. Mrs. Eddy believed that Christian science was revealed only to her and that it should be considered the final word, that she was in essence the prophet of Christian science and that teaching. And Emma Curtis Hopkins felt that the truth had been revealed to many people throughout history and that the truth was available to everyone. And so they separated. And it, she says, it says, after the split, she started a college called Christian Science and graduated its first class in 1886. And she acknowledged three sciences, the material or physical science that declares the basic laws like gravity, right? Mental science, as all that we are, is made up of our thought. So that, how we think of ourselves, that self-awareness, self-concept, that whole frame of reference that we've carried with us since childhood, right? That I know I keep saying and people are like, we don't deal with that, you know, we turn away from the condition and well, it's like that stuff. I will believe it to be true and will continue teaching it forever at this point in my life, because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but maybe tomorrow I'll change my mind. But today I still believe we work out of a frame of reference that we are inductive about constantly. Why do I do that? How do I do that? Do I do it this way? Should I do it that way? Oh no, what do they think of me? Oh, what do I think of them? Oh my God, I can't believe they've said that. We work out of a frame of reference all the time. We have judgments, and that's why she's saying, we need to keep high watch. Behold who that has created. We've created who we are. And we need to be able to step out of that. That's how she's, what she's saying. So mental science as is that we are made up of our thought. And the mystical science, which is what she emphasizes throughout her books. She is the mystic. They call her the new mystic. She was the first of the new mystics, I guess, mm -hmm. at some level. I don't, I don't know. I would say Emerson and Trollard were also mystics, and they came before. So I don't, I don't know about that. But um, she also says, they also say this. So that's who Emma Curtis Hopkins is. And then she was the teacher of teachers. This is what everyone tells us. She was the teacher of teachers. She taught the Fillmore. She taught Ernest Holmes. You know, unity. She taught science of mind. She taught um, Christian science. But just going back, uh, finishing up on your three sciences, one of them is the mystical science. Mm -hmm. You give uh, on, on the physical, you gave a brief, a brief description, and also on the mental, can you give a brief description on the mystical besides saying other people who were mystical? And I'm sorry, I, I missed what you're asking or what you're saying. Uh, a brief description of the mystical. Oh, you want a brief description? Like you did for the physical and the mental. Because what I said was, which is what things. she emphasized. Yeah. So um, she would say that the mystical is being able to go to that divine place and know that you are God. That that is the mysticism. And that is that intuitive property that is within each one of us. And so um, this is what someone said about her. They say, make an agreement as you begin reading her works not to be intimidated by her writing style. Said, for example, we might say thoughts are things, but Emma would say it this way. The great white glory within, all hot with the spirit, warms some word into feeling and to shape as the warmth and dew forces the amoeba to spring into the shape of a man or plant, that which the sunlight of understanding has gleamed upon, stirred to take form. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right? And they suggest you read her paraphrase, her words out loud to really feel them because they're graceful. They're really like, they flow. It's like, God, we say, oh, it's like putting a seed into the soil and watching the plant flourish. And she's like, the amoeba and the light and the warmth. And, the, and it's like, whoa, and it all takes hold. And then it's gleamed upon, stirred to take form. And that's who we are. We are gleamed upon in order to take form. We've been given that gift. And 
let's let's step forward and be open to receive it is my encouragement. So read Emma out loud. Pretend you are Emma. <laughs> Can you imagine what she was like? And maybe she had her own self-doubt. Who knows? Who knows? Because she wouldn't ever write about that, no doubt. That um, just pretend that you are. How powerful that might be. And then know that you are the same God that she is. Yeah. And the same energy. This is what Ernest Holmes says. Because everyone says, Emma Curtis Hopkins home taught Ernest Holmes. And Ernest Holmes says this, in 1957, Ernest Holmes on mysticism, he goes, I wish I could mimic him, but I cannot. He goes, I knew Emma Curtis Hopkins. I did take her course. Anyone who would say he studied with, quote unquote, Emma Curtis Hopkins would be misstating the fact. No one ever studied with her that I know of. You went and she talked for an hour and you left and you went again and this happened 12 times and that was it. I know I bought the course at that time and was more familiar with, the then, with it then than now, but the ideas of consciousness she imparted, I did not forget. It was a very definite impartation in what she did from what she said. And at times, it was almost like a wind, a breeze. You might be familiar with what is called a psychic breeze, something that is alive and animated. They have, they've said, so that's what Ernest says. He says, you don't study with Emma Curtis Hopkins. In another place, it says that Emma Curtis Hopkins did not teach you. She believed that you already knew, and that she was what she was trying to do was to engage you to impart the wisdom that was already within, to recognize the truth in yourself, that she can't teach that to you, like I can't teach that to you. Emma can't, reading Emma can't teach it to you. You have to hold high watch. You have to repent in that sense. Be reflective and then step forward into the new. That's Emma Curtis Hopkins. And essentially that's chapter one. But we're going to be going over more of that. But let's take a break right now and we'll pick up with this in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. You're on. And I'm recording. Ooh, yay. Ooh. I think we need to turn that down. Oh, the batteries are powerful otherwise. <laughs> batteries are my good. I think it still needs to go down a bit because I've given a lot of feedback. That would do it maybe. Is that still too loud? No, that's, no, that's, that's good. Okay. So, any thoughts on everything that we um, have talked about thus far? No? Everyone is good? Good as you got? Okay. Then I would like to, Emma Curtis Hopkins starts almost all of her books with these quotes about the um, Upanishads. Is that the correct way to say that? Upanishads. Upanishads. And so um, Robert Ellsworth, who wrote World Religions, and see, I bring everything I do into my classes. Um, I'm in uh, World Religions 501 in the Holmes Institute right now. And we're going to play a, a, just about a, maybe a three or four minute thing about what he says about the Upanishads. So that we kind of have an idea where Emma is coming from when she's talking to us. Yeah, or, or um, Robert, right? No, no, John. <laughs> John. We, there's a, if you open that door on the right, you'll see where it, it's taped on there to hit play on your far right. Down on the bottom down there, there's some tape that says play. It has the symbol for play and pause. Up, up, put your finger up, a little to the right, down, right there. This one? Yep, play. Is it play? Which today certainly is by far the best known. And the great secret of the Upanishads, which it teaches over and over in many different words and ways, is that Atman, that is the self that is within, is really one with Brahman, the universal. 
Atman, you can call it the soul, the self, the personality, even the ego, even. But whatever it is, it is one with Brahman, the universal light, the universal power. Here is a couple of uh, lines I'd like to read from the um, Siddhasattara Upanishad, which expresses this very beautifully and poetically, that Brahman is really all that is and is found within all beings. O Brahman supreme, formless art thou, and yet though the reason none knows, thou bringest forth many forms. Thou bringest him forth and then withdrawest into thyself, fill us with thoughts of thee. Thou art the fire, thou art the sun, thou art the air, thou art the moon, thou art the starry firmament, thou art Brahman supreme. Thou art the waters, thou the creator of all. Thou art woman, thou art man, thou art the youth, thou art the maiden, thou art the old man tottering with his staff, uh, thou facest everywhere. Thou art the dark butterfly, thou art the green parrot with red eyes, thou art the thunder cloud, the seasons, the seas, Without beginning art thou beyond time, beyond space, thou art he from whom sprang the three worlds. And then it goes on to say something else, and that is that might is thy divine consul. Many are her children, children of might. The rivers, the mountains, flowers, stone, and tree, beast, bird, and man, in every way like himself. But thou, spirit in flesh, forgetting who what thou art, unitest with might. Maya, in other words, is the consort of Brahman, speaking poetically and metaphorically, but in a deeper sense is Brahman itself. But Brahman, as it is manifested in all of the many different things in this world, the mountains, the trees, the, the human being. The word Maya perhaps is related to our word magic suggesting that the world as we see it is related to, or is a kind of magical spell that Brahman has cast. Creating an listening. illusion of it being many different things, but actually it is only one. There. So, we perceive it as many different things when in actuality it's only one. And he uses the same kind of flowery language, right, when he was reading that Emma Curtis Hopkins is using. Did you notice that? But I think that's profound, actually. So who comes first is my question sometimes when we're reading some of these things. And so Emma Curtis Hopkins, towards the end of the book, um, on page 18 of the book, not, no, 18 here, 16 in the book, or 15 in the book, sorry, because I have three different things. She says that through repentance, that we return to our true nature because when we reflect on and know that we are God and let go of all of the BS, essentially, right, then we can move forward into God. But we can't take those old stories with us. So in that sense, it takes a different turn than what Christianity has taken to mean repent of <coughs> your sins and you know, kind of kind of kneel and, and, and you know, suffer the consequences. We don't have to suffer. All we have to do is go, Oh, and then do something different. Recognize who we are. She says on page 13 that we begin to return to our true nature, which is the meaning of the word repent, which I like. I liked having that new definition given to me. We turn, we lift up our, we lift up the willing inner sight towards the Supreme One, look unto me and be saved so to speak, but it also means we hold a clear idea of what is our good. We name our good. All truth is waiting for us to say plainly what is our good. There is no spot or place where the idea of good of ours cannot come. It will come and settle on us. It will express itself through us. It will be absorbed by all the cells of our systems. And so, to Selena and um, John, no, you're Robert. <laughs> um, matter that is, you know, that appears. How do you do that? And poverty versus possessions. It's right there. That if we step out of this, is how I view that. And then I'm going to invite people to share what you think about the same thing, because 
it's all God. It's all our highest good. It's all our highest good. If, you know, I always go back to Edwin Gaines who says, you know, if you want to drive around in a funky old Mustang, that's fine. That's your idea of good. My idea of good is a white on white Cadillac, right? Convertible Cadillac, get that. A white on white convertible Cadillac. And um, she was like, that's up to you. you. She was telling that story to her best friend when she gave the talk in Unity back years ago. And that's what she, her friend was like, oh, Edwin, your Cadillac is so ostentatious, right? And she was like, ostentatious. This is my idea of my wealth. This is who I am. If you want to drive around in that piddly Mustang, you go right ahead. But some people would want that piddly Mustang, right? I would prefer a piddly Mustang. <laughs> you know, than a white-on-white -white convertible Cadillac. That's just not me. So who are you? It is your highest good, right? So I would say the material wealth you have is your good. It is your God. It's the material that you've created in your life. That's what Emma Curtis is, Hopkins is saying. And if you don't like it, then let it go. And when you let something go and know that your highest good is still here, more can come in when we release that that doesn't serve us. Yes? When I was reading this, I got the word inspiration, like you, inspi you know, inspire your breath, bring spirit into you, but you also are inspired to towards something. I, I visualize like the sun flowers, you know, keeping with the light of the sun, but I also you know, see the plants growing towards the sun, and my good is what I move towards, and right. that I am inspired by. Right. See, it is all one mind, because Nancy wasn't here when I read that earlier piece. <laughs> was she? So it's all one mind. And I'll read, I'll show it to you later. You're going to be amazed and astounded at the guide you are. <laughs> so, um, that is this. And then she gives you these things on page 15 that she wants you to practice every Monday. And this is how she, they're breaking it out in these books and in this workbook. Every Monday you practice repentance. Every Tuesday you're going to practice the negation. Every Wednesday you're going to practice the forgiveness. And so you're going to go through it and eventually Towards the end, we pull it all together from these first six lessons, which are all about you and who you are, before you move into Mystic as the Healer. How fun, huh? It's a lot of work, but let's read them. But I don't want to read them. I think other people should read them. And let's hear other people's voices here tonight. So um, who would like to read the first one on page 15? Okay. Well, you can share with me. Lesson one, the practice. Monday mornings, focus on being. Begin the week by turning your face from all the things, events, and people that call your attention and looking toward the highest good, speak the statement of being, the holy name, I am that I am. Name also the comforting presence, the Emmanuel, who has been called Jesus Christ by so many, who lifts us from the pitfalls of our lives. Sit with those names until you feel them moving in you. Thank you. Who would like to pick up? In that mystical space, feeling the highest presence, name the good that your heart calls out for. Doing so, you are naming God as you are prepared to experience it. You are speaking truth, God's word, for your life. I am seeking my good, and my good is my God, because it draws, pushes, and moves me on. Is that lesson three? The good that I am seeking is my God. My God is my life. The good I am seeking is my abundant health and well-being. God is my health and well-being. The good I am seeking is my strength in all things. God is my strength. <clears throat> 
The good I am seeking is my support and supply. God is my support. God is my supply. God is the infinite resources that allow me to express the God that I am. The good I am seeking is my satisfaction and joy. God is my joy in all situations. Life is God. Truth is God. Love is God. Substance is God. Intelligence is God. Omnipresent, omniscient, from the book, omnipotent. Because God, my God, is omnipresent. God, my God, is omniscient. God, my good, is omnipotent. These words, she said, they say are suggestions only. Feel free to use whatever similar words inspire with you. But sit down at a certain time every day and write down on paper your idea of good, the highest ideas of good that your inner vision holds, and that repetition will make it more real. And it will deepen and clarify your understanding of the good you seek and the good that you are. So how has your, before we talk about the lessons of the metaphors, how has your daily writing been going this week? Reading, writing, meditating. Hey. I have not been doing very good at keeping it up. Anybody? I've gotten really good uh, getting back into a regular meditative practice. Excellent. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Yes. It helped me a lot to, you know, get a regular meditation and, and the writing. It's real hard for me to journal, but for some reason, I'm doing it. So. Oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> Anyone else? I just found it a, a really positive way to start today. Right. Right. And she's, again, it's dedication, consistency, and repetition. So. I really strongly urge you, if you want to learn Emma Curtis Hopkins, follow her teaching. You know, like do the practice. Take, even if it's 10 minutes in the morning. You all know that story that, um, it's your fault, I'll blame you again, that um, August Gold and I had that exchange about spiritual practice, right? Mm -mm. No, so let me tell it again. Some of you have heard it because you've been in other classes. So um, August Gold was here now four years ago, three. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. And, um, and who is August Gold? She's a she's out of New York, and she's a inspirational speaker. And she's a minister in a new thought field, and um, very inspiring. Just. Her, her partner has got an amazing vocalist. And um, anyway, they were here, and um, August Gold gave a workshop on spiritual practices. I can't remember the exact name of it. But she was telling about her, you know, what is your spiritual practice? And she was asking people, and, and she, you know, but she was like, let's work with someone who has a problem like that. <laughs> and no one said anything. Like, you know, the room was full, it was packed, but it was people in standing room only, and no one said anything. And so she was like, come on, everyone's got problems. Who's got a problem? And I, earlier I had mentioned to Breezy that I was having some difficulty with my finances, I believe it was, at that time, which, listen to that, I don't any longer. But, um, and no one said anything, and then Breezy goes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> She's got something she'll share. <laughs> And so I talked with August Gold, and her first question was, what is your spiritual practice? And I was like, well, you know, I meditate and I read. And she goes, that's not a spiritual practice. And I said, but I do it regularly. I was arguing with her. And she's <laughs> like, that's not a spiritual practice. Yeah, and I was, well, what the, you know, dedication, repetition, you know, consistency, that's a spiritual practice. 
right? Otherwise, it's hit and miss. And essentially, she called me out in front of everybody that day. And then at the break, though, she came over and she started talking to me. She goes, what's the first thing that you do in the morning? And I was like, you know, besides my personal, you know, cleanliness type stuff. And I was like, um, I feed my cats. And she goes, well, kind of like, she was like, well, do you have to feed your cats first? Because what you need to do first is sit right back down once you're awake and read. And I was like, no, I, I have to feed my cats. <laughs> they would not let me alone. So, and then she goes, and then what do you do? Well, then I drink coffee, and then maybe I do something else, or I do this. And she was like, no, the first thing you do every morning is sit down and pick up a book and read for a certain amount of time. Pick an amount of time. Doesn't matter the book. It can be a different book every day. Just read it and then write about it. <clears throat> read it and write about it and then meditate. Read, write, and meditate for equal amounts of time. And she said, I guarantee you, your life will change. And um, I was a little skeptical, honestly, and so I picked up her book and I thought, I'll read this, you know, since. She's the one challenging me. And she was in contact with me by email. She, an amazing thing. But um, I made it through her book, reading, writing, and then I picked up another book. And that's how, I, that's how I got through this. You know, maybe sometimes it was just two or three pages at a time, but then that's what I wrote about. And what did it mean to me? What kind of came to me as I was reading? And then that's what I meditated about. And I still do that. And it's the amazing amount of clarity that comes, honestly. And I owe it to Breezy. <laughs> Thank you. Because I got called out. <laughs> I have a question. Does it have to be in that order, read, write? Yes. Okay. Yes. I asked that very same question. I, and she was like, read, write, and meditate. Excite your mind. Right? Clarify some thoughts and then meditate and allow it and then release it. Mm -hmm. Let it breathe in the divine and release it. Breathe in and release in your meditation. Yeah? So many people say read, write, meditate, and no one has ever said read this, write about it, and meditate about it. Mm -hmm. Oh. So. That's a whole different thing than just reading and then writing, maybe just stream of consciousness and then just sitting still. Yeah, nobody's it's clarified. It's a whole yeah. different ball game if you're reading and then writing about what you read and then meditating about what you read. Connecting. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I'm looking, going, okay, I read, write, and meditate. It doesn't do a darn thing. Right. But I'm not. I didn't have that extra little piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the, that's the kicker right there. Mm -hmm. And then what we put into our minds stimulates that activity and it becomes who we are. So if you want to read something like Stephen King and you know, <laughs> write about it and meditate with that going on, well, or read Stephen something like that before you go to bed, you know, that's up to you. It's no different than me listening to Pink before I walked in here and I'm like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> um, last week you said also the fourth step was journal. I didn't get to the journal part. That's the second, the second step. step. Uh, right. But what happened is during the day I would um, think about that early morning happening and all of a sudden new thoughts were building. On it, and right. in my experiences of the day, I could catch myself when I was getting away from my good and thinking of a problem. Oh, good, excellent. Which reminded me of something else that she said to me in an email. And, and if I'm, you know, if August ever listens to this, and I'm, I'm, I'm repeating this incorrectly, I hope she lets me know. But um, that the daily meditations are great, but she suggested a book a clear train of thought that is one connection to the next every day until you finish the book. So like the daily meditations are great, but um, use those as a secondary thing, but read a book, pick up a book, read Emma Curtis Hopkins, read, write, and, and meditate on the book itself. That's, that's where that clarity comes from because these are our masters. These are what we want to make our frame of reference as opposed to everything that we've learned 
thus far, and that comes through repetition. Any questions about that? So these things, this list, she's, we're expecting you. She's expe I'm going to blame it on Emma Curtis Hopkins and um, Ruth Miller. Um, do these things every day. Every day, just sit there. Just like some of you might still be saying the treatments um, for prosperity for the center, you know, or the prosperity treatment during the summer, you know. I, Catherine Grayson, know that, you know, if someone starts well, also, so God is the source of all supply. <laughs> and the money is God in action. I know that my good is here now. I am so rich and so full that I have an abundance of money to share and share today and always. I know that to be prosperity includes perfect health, perfect wealth, and a perfect happiness. This word which I seek and make known now activates universal law and I accept the results. I bless all that I have now and I bless the increase. I bless all the others in the increase of the number of my class and time and time and time and prosper together in every way. And I give thanks for this good and so it is. Right? Yay! Yay. Amazing. <laughs> that, I love that, right? Because repetition, yeah. once again, the repetition and the consistency that Barbara requires for the prosperity class is, is everything that Emma Curtis Hopkins talks about. Right? Dedication, something, and... Consistency and repetition. Those are the kind of the three things that she goes on about. And then um, she goes into the metaphors. Emma Curtis Hopkins is big on metaphors. And she, in this book, particularly High Mysticism, the alternative or the secondary book for this class, is all metaphor. She go, she'll take one metaphor after another. And she goes, it's amazing, really, for people who've read it or people who are looking at it. She'll talk with, um, and half of the names I can't pronounce, this woman is incredibly well-read and knowledgeable, brilliant. She, amazing. It, I only dream of reading as much as she's able to cite here. She says, um, she talks about, uh, and this I return, which hath divine reward, return unto me and I will return unto you, said the heavenly voice to Malachi. We know that's the Bible. And then she goes on to cite Hermes Trismegatus. Trismegatus. Do you know? You're also very well read, B. See? <laughs> David, you would have known that had I called you. And then um, the Upanishads. And then she talks again from the Bible. And then she's talking from St. Bernard, Abbot of Clairvaux. And she, it's just amazing. She just goes from one to the other and giving examples of essentially the same thing over and over and over again. The metaphors are important. How we create our life is based on metaphor. And that's how we describe our life, too, as well. So think of the metaphors in your own life. Right? And the metaphor is that my car is my good. And if my good is my God, then the essence of God is in the car. Yeah. Or in the material things. So if you look in the book on the metaphor page, which is page Can 16. I just add something about, um, she, I know that uh, Christianity is a big part of her upbringing. Yeah. And, and she talks about Judas here. And I, sh I know it comes, you know, from the Bible, but uh, Judas always gets a bad rap. So I like to think about the fact that I think he was a very highly evolved soul to volunteer to come into this life to betray Jesus. That was such a huge thing. And so I think he was really, really an evolved, very evolved soul to do that. 
and it went, you know, the Jesus story could not have unfolded if Jesus, if Judas had not played that part. Mm -hmm. So I think he agreed before he came to this life to do that. Mm -hmm. So I have to think about that when she's saying Judas was this and that and the other. But she also calls it the Judas genius. Right. Right, and, and, and she doesn't, because Emma Curtis Hopkins doesn't recognize evil or, or fault at all. She, she moves past that, and she also says, the Judas genius is opened in us when we perceive divine intelligence, the pure poverty of apparent things as God, which is where um, Robert was going earlier. Possessing all the spirit, I am to own and possess no thing. But what they're saying, what she's actually saying there, is that if we make those things higher, if we make our car higher, then if we value it more than life itself, right, becoming an idol, which is what um, Laura and I think Kristen also talked about, you maybe did too, Vivian, right, about you know, this kind of like adultery that your wedding ring is more important to because of the diamonds and the silver than what it what it intends to represent, then that's that's the problem. That if there is a problem, that would be that that would be that um, uh, duality, right? Because that's, it's that's what she said was she, uh, Judas was guilty of paying too much attention. Mm -hmm. And she calls it a genius because it gives us that lesson, that parable to work from. Right? She doesn't condemn him. I would say that she doesn't, but that's how you read it? Yeah, that's how I read the first, not, not the last paragraph, but the one, the second paragraph at the top, uh, where she said that Jesus was uh, called that the expensive oils be used on Jesus rather than sold for the poor. And then he later sold Jesus' life for silver. So she's, that seems to me like she's condemning him. Okay. Okay. So I have a question about, um, it, is it where, if you place that idol above God, basically, are you separating your, or you're separating your thought from God? Like, she mentioned something about the absence, evil is just the absence of God. Right. So is, is that what happens when you put that thought of an object higher than God? Is you're, you're creating that separation? Hmm. I'm going to defer to David. Maybe a slightly different way to say it might be uh, to not put the manifestation above the source. So, you know, just like with the wedding ring, not to put the ring above the marriage. Right. It's what the ring represents that's important. I like cars, I love cars, but they represent abundance and not forget that that car is a thing, you know, whatever. Uh, I can always get another car because I understand abundance. So okay. not to get it so exactly what you said, I just kind of tweak the words. Yeah. Okay. As long as I'm talking, can I chime in about the Jews story? Please, I was going to ask you to comment on okay. that. So where it goes for me is, I have to remember the context of the story. The story was written by a bunch of people that put together the Bible to help establish the Christian church and all of that. So the story has a certain slant to it. And I was taught that slant as a Baptist kid. So when I look at it that way, and then there's another piece of it that says, so of all the people that want to hang around Jesus, one of the people he chose was Judas. And there had to be a good reason for that. And I don't think it was just so we could betray him, mm -hmm. personally. Um, so I don't know where all that goes, but I have to say there was something about Judas that allowed him to be part of the 12th side. And that's as far as it goes. Right. I don't need to figure it all out and understand right. it all. But, but when I step back and kind of look at it from a larger picture, it kind of looks different. So I kind of dismiss my Baptist upbringing a little bit. I put it in context, think about it a little bit differently, and then I'm okay. Right. <laughs> that's as, and that's as far as it goes for me. Too. Okay. Yeah. 
Would anyone else like to comment on that before I go on? Because for me, it goes to that whole metaphor piece. It's that, and it's also that we all operate out of the level of our own awareness, right? And so whatever the awareness that Judas had, who knows? But there was something there that he believed he was doing was right at that moment in that time for him. Right? Just like we always want a villain, so we pick out individuals that don't meet the expectations that we have of them. And so Judas has been one of those people throughout time. So has Hitler, right? So has Mussolini. God, we could go through and name hundreds of people who haven't met the, our expectations. You know, the people, you know, who, the, I forgot the gentleman's name now, the, uh, the person who assassinated Martin Luther King, or the person who shot President Kennedy. You know, all of those people, we villainized them as well, but they were all acting out of their level of awareness of where they were, believing that they were doing something good. And then we turn and we can judge them, but the truth is that all of that has created our frame of reference so that we, the people here who believe that we are, I am the I am, I am my good, can step out of that and be the new... I'm beginning to sound like a preacher. I'm like, oh my God. And be the light that we are to be in the world. This is our voice right here. So a metaphor is supposed to be a, a, a comparison. So what is the comparison here? A metaphor is not a comparison. A metaphor is a description of the event. Well, the dictionary says... A simile says is a comparison. A, no, the dictionary says it's a, it's a comparison. That means one okay. thing... It means it says one thing, but it means something else. See, and I teach it differently. But okay, I'll so go with your I don't definition. Know what, I don't know what she. I don't know what she's comparing this uh, story about Judas. I don't know what that the metaphor is to go metaphor. to your own life, Sue. Yeah. So, so um, talking about metaphors, I think that each one of the twelve apostles, each. And many characters in the Bible, if not all of them, mm -hmm. were actually metaphors for something. So Judas, it's not like he was a bad man, but he was he was um, uh, descriptive of a certain person, a certain type of person that existed at that time, that exists you now. And so each one of them, so rather than thinking of them as good or bad personalities, I think they're all metaphors. Maybe Jesus is too. For but, our um, own experience. For our own experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that takes out the, you know, was he a bad man or something? I don't. I don't see a comparison um, between Judas and say Hitler or something, who was an actual human being with a different, possibly a different purpose, at a different time. Um, you know, so I don't see that comparison, but um, I think that they're all metaphors. What if you apply that metaphor to yourself? Just curious. <clears throat> because it strikes a chord in you, which is important. So in my experience, when something strikes a chord for me, it's like, whoa, I need to, I need to figure this one out. Yes. I was going to say, um, piggybacking off uh, what she said. Um, um, Sue? Yes. Okay. Sue. Um, I, uh, I like Neville Goddard. He's a mystic. I study him a lot. And he says everybody in the Bible was actually a state of mind. Um, and he actually has, he goes through all the 12 disciples in one of his talks, the states of mind that they are. So that'd be something that someone might want to look into. What's that name? Neville Goddard. Neville Goddard? Yeah, he's yeah. a mystic from the Is 19th. everybody else familiar with him? Do you want me to write it on the board? Okay. I'm assuming this, right? Yes. yes. A lot a lot of his talks are in YouTube. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, okay. You can find them all over. Yeah, he's YouTube. got hundreds on YouTube. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Are you good, Selena? Yeah. Okay. Then um, she also, so she talks, she uses numbers as metaphor, she uses stones, she uses all sorts of stuff. And so, um, 
like Jasper, the white stone, and she gives a little definition out of the book of Revelation, because she's basing Christianity to that, that degree of her awareness during that time. And so when we read this, we have to like, you know, step it into new thought. I would encourage you to. Yes, Rick. Uh, one thing I've turned over in my head for years <clears throat> is the, the, uh, the old, old set tapes. And, uh, is the what? Set tapes. Oh, set. Set, set. set speak. Yeah. Uh, and, and that uh, channel thing, it put through the uh, uh, idea that you know, the, the Jesus consciousness that, that came here uh, that actually, and this happens all the time, is that the, the uh, uh, people involved were all the same individual, but we s here we see different aspects of the same consciousness. And John the Baptist was another part of him, uh, so to speak. His mother was. <laughs> and his disciples were all parts of the same uh, entity, I guess you'd call it, that came here, uh, interacting. And so uh, that the way I've thought about it is that, you know, that they all represented, uh, you know, like Peter was faith and uh, and Judas was that part of his own character uh, that uh, Emma was talking about that uh, betrayed him. It brought it up to his awareness. Right. And he, he overcame it. So, you know, there, there's not <coughs> a bad quality or a good quality. It was just something he had to see, or that consciousness had to become aware of. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah. So if I bring that metaphor back home, I know all about Judas because there's a part of me that is often, has sometimes betrayed the interests of my highest self. Right. self -sad. Period. Yeah. Period. Right. You know what I mean? Instead of meditating, well, we'll play one more computer game. Whatever. Right. <laughs> I know all about Judas. Right. On a personal basis. Right. I like that. I like that. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank the, you. The, the word coming, the sabotaging behaviors. Yeah. You know, that like, oh, I really want to do that, but then yeah. you get in your own way. Right. <laughs> right. That makes sense. So this has been great. I think we could talk about lesson one for a very long time, but we're going to move on to lesson two. And here's the thing. I think I said on last week that this class was set for nine weeks because the first week was kind of business and getting stuff underway. So you guys are good to go through the second week of November. Is that correct? I just want to clarify that. Nancy yes. was asking me to clarify that. And yes. I was like, I'll, I'll, let me ask the class first. So it go, we're going to take it to the 9th, I believe, of November then. Okay, great. Because this kind of discussion could go on and on. Yes? But it's nine weeks and we have 12 yeah. lessons. We'll, we be doubling, double we'll be doubling up. Yeah. So, um, but we're going to double up after the first few, like the first couple more. Let's get used to this kind of self-reflective being who we are as the I am, and um, know that, and then once we're solid with that, we'll, we'll start speeding things up a bit, okay? Does that sound good? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And then, um, so, start with lesson two, and um, that's another long one, and not long, but deep, about negation. How do we, how do, we do that? And, Oh, negation of the unreal, which is some of what we were talking about today. So the conversation is going to go back to some of this and also to how we talk to ourselves. Because how we talk to ourselves, how we view ourselves with that inner eye is reflected back to us, much like we're talking today in the metaphor of the Judas principle. So, whoo! <laughs> 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 I 
Knocking in the bathroom. Come out. Um, we were telling ghost stories in one of my classes today about we were just reading out of their textbook and I said, read it like a ghost story. And so they were like doing metaphysical teaching. It's like a process. <laughs> Like repeating the multiplication tables until you know, and they were, we were cracking up. It was a great, great thing. Oh, read Emma Curtis Hopkins aloud too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Okay. So before we do the offering, and then Nancy is going to close us out tonight with the spiritual mind treatment. I just like to say that um, the abundance that fills this room is what we all share and what we all grow and live from, that it is all sacred and that everything that is given comes back to us, multiplied, and that it goes out and touches everything and everyone, that abundance is the life that we live, that prosperity is the life that we live, that joy is the life, that health is the life that we live, that it's all grace, that it's all movement, and it's all movement forward. Trust that which you see and know that you are. And so it is. And so, so it is. is. Upanishads. God is everyone in this room. God is the light and the love and the movement forward. I am that I am. I am the love and the light and the inspiration in this world. I am. All that there is, I am the only one. And this is true of everyone in this room. There is only one. And I know for and with every one that they are the light and the love of this world and that they breathe in their inspiration and they see it before them and they move towards it and they go out into the world this evening with love and might and peace and joy in their hearts. And it radiates out to their families, their neighbors, their workmates, whoever they meet in the life, in their life walk, right here, right now, and always. In all is ease and grace and beauty. And I am grateful for this teaching, and I am great, grateful for this center, and I am grateful for Kate, and I am grateful for everyone in this class. And I release these words with my grateful heart into that living, loving law that only says yes, and I am done. And so it is. Thank you, everyone.